I was in my yoga class today when I suddenly had the thought of what is the point? <laughs> why am I here? Why, why am I doing this? Um, obviously I know why I do yoga and why I exercise but I thought what is the point if I know I have not been looking after myself in other ways and specifically that way is diet. <laughs> what is the point in exercising and trying to stay healthy when I poison myself with the foods I eat and I know this stuff is poison <laughs> trust me I have done my research and I'll talk about it a little bit later but I know full well when I'm eating foods that are unhealthy and yet I do it anyway out of convenience out of I don't know maybe not laziness but time restraints especially with uni it is just so easy to pour some hot water in a pot and have some instant noodles and not worry about what is actually in that stuff which has an ingredients list the size of the palm of my hand <laughs> but I had a little bit of a back to reality moment um, in this yoga class in that if I want to be doing my best then I need to recenter myself and get back on track with what I'm eating because it has been too easy to slip into mindless eating and well my take specifically is on seed oils which are very inflammatory <laughs> so I went to Tesco and I bought as much food as I could that did not include seed oils and I thought it would be instructional to kind of talk about what I eat when I am focused on my health and what is what I consider good food versus bad food and that's not good or bad in the moral sense but in the sense of what nourishes your body that kind of thing. First I am going to talk about why I avoid seed oils and why that is a resolution of why mine, why it matters to me um, <laughs> because there is a lot of science especially for women of course that backs this up and that it affects your hormones, your inflammation, all that kind of stuff. So. I have definitely noticed the difference when I eat foods that are not whole or like single ingredient foods. If I come close, you guys can see my skin is not doing so well. I have eye bags. I feel my face is puffier than it used to be. I just feel sluggish. I feel not well. <laughs> and I think that is very much due to the food that I'm eating. Maybe a little bit of sleep stuff too, but it's something that I need to reassess and it is definitely from all the seed oils I've been eating. I went through a long period in Thailand where I avoided anything that wasn't whole. I cooked pretty much everything we ate from scratch, even our bread. <laughs> and during that time, me and the person I was cooking for, we were glowing, we were doing so well. And I, f I remember feeling so nourished and whole and healthy and in a way that I just haven't been feeling recently so hopefully returning to that kind of diet will help me a little bit but here is the science behind seed oils first of all I'm going to clarify what seed oils are because I'm not sure whether a lot of people know what they are I know I didn't until recently but I feel like my sort of bubble and echo chamber online is definitely very aware of it seed oils are essentially any oil that is refined that doesn't naturally come from a vegetable or a fruit or the earth it is something that has to undergo a lot of bleaching processing i'll, I'll talk about the full process in a second but it's anything essentially that is like a man-made oil and that we eat so there are eight big ones that you should look out for in ingredients and cooking and those are canola oil, soybean oil, corn oil, sunflower oil, that's a big one and it's one that you might not expect because you think sunflower is sunflower seeds, no, it's not good for you, it's not a real oil, cottonseed oil, safflower oil, grapeseed oil slash rapeseed oil and rice bran oil and there's another one that's on there that I didn't realize was super inflammatory and it's one that I love and I'm, I'm so sad to give it up and it is sesame oil. I used to cook everything with sesame oil because it has such a rich like nutty flavor but nothing I, I didn't realize that it was really bad for me until I looked it up and I was like, oh my god, this is causing havoc on my body and well, it's in a lot of Asian cooking, so watch out for that one. Essentially, when you are making seed oils, the process is very long and very difficult. I'm going to read out 
like a simplified version of the steps. You extract the oil, you degum it, you neutralize it, you wash it, you bleach it, you winterize it, and then you deodorize it. So there's a lot of steps and at the end it's like edible. Um, whereas with an olive you or a coconut, you press it and oil comes out basically. I know I sound super like conspiracy theory-ish, but I'm very much of the belief that as human beings, we have evolved to eat a certain diet that comes from the earth, uh, including animals and stuff like that. And things like bleaching, deodorizing your food, it feels very intrinsically wrong to me. And of course, it is then backed up by science, which says that, for example, consuming things like seed oils increases your risk of death by diet slash lifestyle factor by 62%, whereas physical inactivity is 48%. That's very high. Um, and it's only next to heavy smoking, which is 80%. So it's, in terms of how bad it is for you, it's between heavy smoking and being really lazy. <laughs> so seed oils are essentially, they are all something called PUFAs or PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the way that they react in the body is to do with the oxidation of mitochondrial cells. Um, if you want to read more about the science behind it, then I recommend a website called Carnivore Aurelius. I'm not the best at kind of explaining the science side behind of it, but it has a lot of like articles and research studies, and it's basically linked to a bunch of things like heart disease, obesity, and all this other stuff that is essentially terrible for you, obviously, because it is not real food, it's manufactured. And they basically argue that since seed oils, things like Crisco and margarine and that kind of thing were introduced into household cooking in the 1950s and 60s obesity has steadily risen and so has people's health people's health has declined i mean if you look at pictures of average people on the beach from like the 1930s and 40s compared to now it is insane how much I'm going to use my words carefully, how unhealthy people look nowadays compared to back then. I think it's very linked to our diet. I think people, I was definitely of the opinion that this was due to meat consumption. I thought that meat was very bad for you. I was a vegan for six years, um, but meat consumption actually didn't change that much between 1950s to now. If anything, meat consumption has gone down while obesity and heart disease and all these other diseases have gone up and it is linked pretty correlationally, is that right, with the consumption of seed oils. I think meat can actually be something that is very healthy for you as long as it is not ultra processed and, you know, like a slab of deli ham is obviously not going to be as healthy as like a steak or liver or anything like that. Um, but another thing that I will say on the topic of meat is because I bought some meat. I'm going to show you guys what I bought without seed oils in a second. But meat essentially can also contain polyunsaturated fatty acids, like PUFAs. But only if they, if the animal, for example, a chicken or a cow, consumes grains. Uh, pork, for example, is one of the most inflammatory foods because they consume so much grain. Um, so if you are trying to avoid inflammatory foods completely, then obviously go for grass-fed meat, which is very rare, or like pasture-raised chickens that don't consume things like corn and soy and that sort of thing, because that affects the quality of the meat and it affects whether it is inflammatory or not. I obviously am a university student, I cannot afford things like grass-fed beef liver chips and all this crazy stuff that I know people like carnivore kind of Aurelius sell. In an ideal world, I could eat grass-fed meat, but right now I'm not in a position to, maybe in the future. Either way, I still consume meat, but I limit other sources of inflammatory foods for that reason. I have seen some crazy transformations of people who stopped eating uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids and instead switched over to a completely whole food kind of almost ancestral diet in in the sense that they only eat like whole vegetables beef steaks liver tallow they cook they fry everything in tallow olive oil coconut oil that kind of thing and just the way that people change on this kind of diet lifestyle is insane and i i really look up to that kind of health conscious that kind of 
holistic health conscious type of thing so I'm gonna try it to do it to the best of my ability as someone in uni with external factors affecting their diet and lifestyle and see how I change hopefully I'll change for the better but this is what I buy when I'm trying to avoid seed oils so here I have my Tesco bag it's fun it's like a, it's like a haul <laughs> I'm one of those YouTubers now. So the first thing I bought was chicken, sliced chicken, um, which I in the, I really like eating sliced chicken. Like I said, I can't afford like beef liver chips. So eating meat is one of the best sources of protein. Obviously protein powder is good for you, but it's not the most bioavailable form of protein I've heard. Meat is the best for muscle synthesis and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm not gonna lie, some people find this gross, but I sometimes just snack on chicken and meat. Um, yeah, so the ingredients on this, surprisingly, I thought that this was more processed than it actually was. The ingredients are quite short. It's basically 99% chicken breast with a little bit of cornstarch, dextrose, salt, glucose, and stabilizer, which is a very short ingredient list. The thing I was mostly looking out for is how long the ingredient list is, and obviously whether they contain any of the big eight or nine um, seed oils this one didn't it is it just has like a little bit of preservatives which allows it to keep um, but as someone who is trying to prioritize meat consumption uh, and protein I think this is a very good option especially if you are a broke uni student which I am the next thing I got is some um, like fruit and veg and stuff basically celery sticks and some plums for snacking as well as some grapes because I feel like I have not been eating enough fruit and veg there's very little fruit and veg or whole foods in my diet at the moment with canteen food it is very far removed from sort of whole foods the most I'd get is like an orange in the canteen and that'll be sometimes be the only fruit or veg I eat in a whole day and I feel like I might get scurvy so I'm prioritizing my fruit and veg Another thing I got is French brie, very nice. Um, there is only one um, ingredient in this and that is pasteurized cow's milk, which is a very short ingredient in this. I have heard a lot about raw milk going around the internet and I am really unsure of where I stand. I've heard people say that pasteurized milk is super inflammatory and bad for you whereas raw milk, cow's milk is full of the best kind of protein it kills lactose intolerance all this like crazy claims i don't really know i am very against like eating antibiotics and stuff which is what apparently they put into pasteurized milk but then i am very worried and conscious of the fact that raw cow's milk is likely to carry diseases and anything that the cow has will be passed over to you. In general, I'm a little bit skeptical of dairy and I'm not 100% sure that we should be eating it. However, I love cheese and it is a whole food, I guess, technically. It's a good source of protein and it's yummy and I feel like if I didn't have any kind of nice things or things that I think, mm, like I love to eat that, I might go a little bit crazy. So. I'm keeping the cheese for now. The final thing I bought, this is a short haul, I guess. I might do a longer one in the future, but this is just for me to snack on and to eat when I have nothing else to eat um, or when the canteen food is terrible, which sometimes it is. I bought this brand Covent Garden soup because it is, well, it's, it's, um, ingredient list is pretty short, surprisingly. Water, potato, onion, chicken, single cream, roast chicken stock, uh, corn flour, salted butter, garlic, salt, black pepper. Very short, no seed oils. Um, this isn't, I've tried this soup before. It's not the most appetizing soup, but it's one of the only soups that I saw in Tesco that did not contain like rapeseed oil or canola oil or whatever, sunflower oil. I might be relying on this kind of soup for the next God knows how long because well, it's a good brand. I know that they use whole ingredients and I kind of trust it as a soup brand. I forgot to mention that I did not buy any bread or anything like that because surprisingly, every single bread that I saw in Tesco had seed oils in it. Bread, every single bread, everything with gluten in it, 
pretty much also had seed oils. I don't know why. Um, when I was making my own bread and pasta, they did not contain anything like that. So I think if you, if you like in eating things that are like quite starchy or carby, then try to make your own because you have no idea what kind of crap they put in this stuff. Like the ingredients list is so long and it is surprisingly easy to make your own. It sounds like a luxury, but if you have just an hour or two spare, it is so worth making your own bread or your own pasta. The reason I didn't buy more is because I don't really have access to a kitchen at the moment. All I have is a microwave, which is why the soup. In an ideal world, I would be buying things like steak, things like whole grass-fed butter they do sell like a local butter um in my nearby market i know that butter is a thing that people really tend to overlook like i thought that you know the brand lopak lopak is that how you say it they i thought it was butter right but i turn it over and it's like 50 percent rapeseed oil which is insane they sneak it into things that you don't even realize which is why i advise to read the ingredients on everything everything i I used to love to snack on like nuts and seeds and that kind of thing, but I didn't even realize that a lot of the time they are roasted or fried in oil or like peanut oil is another one that is really inflammatory. I also forgot to mention one of my favorite snacks that I'm actually eating while I'm editing and that is popcorn. <laughs> I know corn is quite inflammatory, but I basically, I bought a little like microwave popcorn machine that I mix olive oil and some Himalayan salt with and it's much healthier than store-bought popcorn which quite obviously has rapeseed oil in it. Um, yeah, Himalayan salt's really good for you. It's full of like magnesium, copper, that kind of thing. And yeah, it's a good snack. I recommend it. Um, it's very good brain food. It helps your brain function and it's low calorie and tasty. Yeah, do your research on this kind of thing and if you are someone who cares about your health and about inflammation and that kind of thing in the body, then make sure that what you are buying is of good quality if you have the money. Um, if you don't, then we're in the same boat. And I am also a broke person trying to eat healthy. And I will try to document what I eat and do health-wise in the future because I'm hoping that this helps someone. Maybe someone out there cares. <laughs> but yeah. I think that's all I really have to say for today. God bless and goodbye.